your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1. We have dealt with the first 10 verses. We're ready to go with verse 11. Okay. We're going to read from verse 11 through the end of the chapter. And then we'll stop and see uh, how much Dr. Kusar can help us with. Uh, we'll be moving along from there. Let's pray. God, we know this is the day you have made. Not yesterday, not tomorrow. Today, this is the day you've made. Help us rejoice and be glad in this day. Bless us as we open this all-important book of yours that we may read and understand, that we may find those things that are forever true about you and about us, how we may be rightly related to you by your grace and our response of faith. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Verse 11. Okay. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a human source, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. You have heard no doubt of my earlier life in Judaism. I was violently persecuting the church of God and was trying to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many among my people of the same age, for I was far more zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. But when God, who had set me apart before I was born and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might proclaim him among the Gentiles, I did not confer with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were already apostles before me, but I went away at once into Arabia, and afterwards I returned to Damascus. Then, after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, and stayed with him fifteen days, but I did not see any other apostle except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard it said, The one who formerly was persecuting us is now proclaiming the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. Okay. Let's see what Dr. Kuzar has to say, the parts I've highlighted for you here. With the exception of Paul's call, this section usually arouses more interest from the historian seeking to develop a chronology of Paul's life than it does from the theologian who's trying to get ready to preach a sermon on Sunday morning. Why does the issue of apostleship figure so prominently in Paul's letter to the Galatians? And let me just remind you once more that the word disciple and the word apostle are two different words. The word disciple means learner, and the word apostle means one sent out, from apostello, to send out. We know that Jesus had many disciples. We know that he called many of them disciples. We know there were 12 who were particularly close to him, but he had many others. Luke tells us at one point he sent 72 of them out, two by two to witness to what they had come to know in Jesus Christ. So we know there were many others. But after Jesus' death and resurrection, the term was contracted again and came to mean in the early church those whom Jesus had personally sent out, and specifically the twelve. Specifically the twelve. Now, with Judas' death, you recall, they came together, the ones who were left, and those eleven prayed and rolled the dice. That was the way they did things in those days, and felt that the magic number had fallen to Matthias, and Matthias should be number twelve. So they were back at full strength. But they certainly didn't include Paul. They didn't even know him at that time, and they certainly didn't know that he was about to become a follower of Jesus within a few years. So, when he calls himself an apostle, he's cutting across many of those in the early church who believed apostles were only 12, 12 of them. Now, let me say a little bit more about this. When John and Charles Wesley 
talked about how we determine what is theologically true, that is, true about God. They said the most important thing we have is Scripture. Number one, the Holy Bible. Second, we have tradition. And the Wesleys were very careful to say that the closer one can get to the historical Jesus, the more uh, attention and the greater credence should be paid to the tradition. So getting as close to the historical Jesus as possible is crucial. And that means, of course, that those who wrote the New Testament. What can we know about these early disciples who wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? I don't mean eyewitnesses. You know we've been through that. And we don't believe any of the four accounts were written by eyewitnesses, but were, but, but were written by the second generation after the death and resurrection of Jesus uh, when they were afraid, well, he's not coming back next week, maybe not next month, maybe not next year or the year after that. Uh, we better get this down in writing. So, but, but nonetheless, they're in the first century. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Even older, the writings of Paul. So for us to believe that Paul was an apostle, even though he never knew the flesh and blood Jesus. But you see, that is a stretch. It is a stretch to say that he was on the way from Jerusalem up to Damascus, which is still the capital city of Syria. And you need to remember that Jerusalem is closer to Damascus than Tulsa is to Oklahoma City. It isn't far when you are on the Golan Heights, the little hills right there around the Sea of Galilee, you can see Mount Hermon in Syria. You can see the snow-capped part of that mountain uh, on a clear day with no, no great trouble. So Syria is just right here. Uh, the Syrian border came right to the Sea of Galilee until the 67 War. In the 67 War, you recall, the Jews were able to push, push back and now we have United Nations forces patrolling a demilitarized zone here. All I'm saying is he was on the way to Damascus, the capital city of Syria, when he was struck down, he said, by the risen Christ, that he heard a voice. It doesn't say anybody else heard it, but he heard this voice. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? Okay. Um, and he says that he was not taught the gospel by anybody else. It is interesting to note that in Luke's book of Acts, it says that two of the disciples, not the twelve, not the original twelve, but two who were disciples of Jesus, living in Damascus, were told to go and explain to Paul what had happened to him. And they had heard about his persecuting Christians, that he had stood and held the robes of others while they stoned young Stephen to death for proclaiming Jesus to be the long-awaited Messiah of God. They were frightened, but if God was telling them to do it, they would do it. They talked to Paul. He says then he went into Arabia. He went east of there, not where the Christian gospel was being preached by some, where it was gradually spreading westward. He went eastward to Arabia. And only after three years did he go up to Jerusalem. And let me remind you, when you and I think up, we think north. It doesn't mean that in the Bible. Uh, Jerusalem was higher elevation than other parts. It's not, the, it's not built on the tallest mountain, but it's on one of the higher hills. Um, so Jerusalem is up in the hills. It's uh, almost a mile up from the lowest part of the, of the Jordan River Valley. So up was in elevation, and up was also theological in that Jerusalem is where the temple was. Uh, it's where the Jews had worshipped for a thousand years, destroyed by the Babylonians in the 6th century, but then rebuilt, and so they had a second temple there. Okay, so when he says he went up to Jerusalem, and he says again, I went up to Jerusalem, uh, he's moving from the north to the south, so it doesn't quite register with you and me until we think of Jerusalem as being up in elevation and up in theological importance. Okay, let's go back. Um, some, and perhaps the majority, contend that Paul is responding to charges made by his opponents in Galatia who say he is not a proper apostle. He has not been commissioned by the Jerusalem authorities and thus is a renegade advocating an unsanctioned message. Other commentators, and he's simply now, Dr. Kuzar is saying, there are other commentaries out there, 
So some agree that Paul is answering the personal attacks of his opponents in Galatia, but say that he is being charged with total dependence on Jerusalem. But what he expounds is the faith he received second or third hand. He was not an eyewitness of Jesus' ministry and ought not be considered a real apostle, those in Galatia some are saying. So Paul's answer is to identify himself as an apostle who received his commission from the risen Christ, not the flesh and blood Jesus. A third group of commentators, and Dr. Kuzar puts in parentheses, and I'm persuaded by their argument, so this is what he believes, raises a more basic question. Was there an attack at all in Galatia? The office per se is not the issue, nor is, nor is who is or who is not an apostle. The point, Paul argues in Galatians, is that any and all power apostles may have derives from the one gospel. Or to put it in the categories of one particular scholar, Dr. Schultz's excellent study, Paul is not interested in legitimacy as much as in authority. He wants them to pay attention to what he preached to them and to hold on to that. Paul was more likely concerned about the unity of the churches in Galatia and whether the Jerusalem leaders were themselves subject to the gospel of grace or were they still trying to work out their salvation by doing Torah. Evidently, he was satisfied with the common source of their commission. That is, he felt a kinship to Peter and James and the others, um, even though he had not known the flesh and blood Jesus. In any case, whether Paul or his opponents have raised the issue, apostleship is a concern bound up with the concern for who has the real gospel, who really knows what the gospel is. And remember, it's centering right now in this little book about do Galatian Christians, forerunners of today's Turks, have to be circumcised And do they have to eat kosher? So, what is affirmed about the priority of the gospel over the apostle can be affirmed in terms of the one who preaches or teaches. That is, our authority comes neither from the congregation nor even from ecclesiastical courts, but from the call of God through the gospel. autobiographical material here to the Galatians that he doesn't write in his other letters. It is essential to retrace Paul's steps so that the Galatians are reminded of where he's been and even have a sworn report of whom he actually saw on his two visits to Jerusalem. Did they teach him the gospel or did he have it before he arrived? That's the question. In numerous sermons, Arabia has symbolized the call for spiritual renewal the call to get away from the hustle and bustle of modern life. But that's pure speculation. The temptation to imagine what Paul might or should have done in Arabia is pure speculation. Another reason for the inclusion of the autobiographical material is less obvious, but perhaps more crucial to Paul's argument, and that is that Paul's own life manifests the power of the gospel. It is the work of God's grace, but it is a fact neither he nor the Galatians can deny. Let me say it a little different way for you. Uh, Many years ago, when uh, I was early in my, my theological education and so on, and you struggle with questions of, well, how do you know that Jesus really was raised from the dead and that sort of thing? And I remember one of our professors saying, well, In addition to the old hymn that says, he lives, he lives, I know he lives, he lives within my heart, the next thing you should look at is what happened to the disciples after that Easter Sunday morning. Before Sunday morning, they had rushed back to the upper room, had bolted the door from the inside, and were frightened to death the same fate was going to befall them. And after Sunday morning, they went with boldness into the streets of Jerusalem, to Judea, 
to all parts of the world they knew, proclaiming, He is alive. He is alive. When they were warned, if you do not stop talking like this, we will do the same thing to you. Their answer, do to us whatever you have to do. We have to preach the gospel we know to be true. And not one ever recanted. Not one. And one after the other met with violent death and violent death and violent death and never ever changed. He prepared breakfast for us. Whatever that story was. You understand? So what Dr. Kusar is saying is Paul's greatest authority should have come from the change that had occurred in his life. I mean, in one moment, he is rushing to Damascus to track down anyone who's saying that Jesus of Nazareth was the long-awaited Messiah perhaps to stone him or her to death as he had seen Stephen stoned to death. And three days later, he is saying, he was the Messiah. He was the Messiah. I've been wrong. This Jesus of Nazareth, Mary's child, was the long-awaited Messiah. And let me tell you what that means. That he who was not responsible for the sins of the world took on himself, took on himself the sins of the world so that there would be nothing to separate us, any of us, all of us, from the love of God. God's grace, God's unmerited favor, God's wanting good to come to you is a gift that all you have to do is receive. It is a gift to be received. That Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah, is now the Lord raised to sit with the Father, to intercede for us. Uh, we are to be accompanied by His Holy Spirit. Um, the Holy Spirit is going to do what Jesus was doing. The Holy Spirit is going to continue the work of God that we saw clearly in Jesus Christ. You understand? That's what Dr. Kuzar is getting at here. Paul's greatest argument is not whether he talked to this one or didn't talk to that one. The greatest, greatest test is what happened to him. His life was forever changed. And he now believed with all his heart. He who had grown up and advanced past people of his own age, he said, he was first in his class, so to speak, circumcised, eating kosher, now saying, I can eat with you what you eat. I can be with you in your home, in your Gentile home, in your formerly pagan heathen home. I can sit and eat with you and call you my brother and sister. That's the greatest claim on Paul's authority is the change that came in his own life. Okay, let's get back to Dr. Kusar here. The revelation, uh, let me go back one sentence further. What is to be made of the statement that Paul received the gospel through a revelation of Jesus Christ? The revelation has to do with some facet of God's redemptive purpose. It is in this latter sense that Paul intends the word here. There is no hint that in the revelation he receives new information that no one else has. Rather, the veil which has hidden God's Son from him has been removed. It had already been removed for others. So Paul isn't teaching and preaching something that nobody else knows, nobody else has experienced. He's simply saying, what Peter and James and John and others experienced, I experienced, even though I was untimely born. Didn't get to know the flesh and blood Jesus. Paul could have sung the hymn we'll sing in July. He lives, he lives, I know he lives. He lives within my heart. So, secondly, Paul does not thoroughly equate gospel with the tradition containing the historical interpretive statements about Christ's death and resurrection. Of course, it has con there are some one needs to know about Jesus of Nazareth, and that content can be expressed in terms of the tradition handed down to us from the apostles, but the tradition does not exhaust the meaning of the word gospel. 
when Paul says, I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through a revelation of Jesus Christ, he is speaking of gospel, not merely information about what Jesus did on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Undoubtedly, Paul knew something about the death and resurrection of Jesus before he started to Damascus, else he would not have bothered to go there to persecute the church. It seems hardly possible that when Paul went later to Jerusalem and stayed with Peter, by the word when it says Cephas here, that's the Aramaic name for the same, same person, uh, that he went to Jerusalem and met with Cephas, it's Peter. He stayed with Peter for 15 days, he said. It doesn't mean they refused to talk about theological matters of serious consequence. He's not saying we never talked about, so what does this say about God? So what does this say about the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit? What does this say about God's kingdom coming on earth? It doesn't mean they didn't talk about important things, but he's saying, in effect, I contributed as much as I got. The infinitive in verse 18 translated for us as to visit, I visited with Cephas, actually means in Greek getting to know someone. It can even mean gaining information from someone. But knowledge of the tradition is not the same as the experience of God's revealing his son to me. I think we have this very clearly in our Methodist tradition that John and Charles Wesley, who had grown up in a parsonage at Epworth, who had been taken to the Anglican or Episcopal Church all of their lives, whose father was a priest, whose mother was a very devout Christian woman, though a dissenter. She didn't believe the Anglican Church had all truth in all matters. She was a nonconformist and couldn't be buried next to her husband because of it. But she was a great woman of faith, as was Samuel, a great man of faith. And yet, after these young men had been through preparatory school, through Oxford, through ordination, through a beginning of their ministry, did each experience within a period of a week a new heartwarming experience. That John wrote his down, an assurance was given me. This strange warming of the heart that my sins, even mine, had been forgiven. And I was set right with God. So to know about God or to know about Jesus is not sufficient. But meeting God, knowing that God has met me, I've responded to God's work in Christ Jesus and so on. That becomes all important. So, Paul in Galatians does not denigrate the early Christian tradition regarding Jesus' death and resurrection. He's not putting that aside. He obviously received it himself and passed it on, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15. When the question of authority arises, however, Paul turns not to the tradition of these apostles, even the twelve, but to gospel, and thus to the moment in his own pilgrimage when he discovered it as good news for him. That did not happen as the result of any particular individual's experience or I mean influence on his life, but as a revelation of Jesus Christ himself. Okay? All right. A few more thoughts here. I'm, I've really uh, gleaned from this just the most important sentences, I think. Okay. What happened on the Damascus Road was a unique experience. Paul's own experience. And we need to be wary of taking it as a model conversion after which all others should be patterned. We do not all have such Damascus Road experiences, nor should we imagine that all of us will, certainly not that we should demand it of others. A crucial feature of Paul's account is the statement that following God's revelation to him, he did not stop to discuss this with any other human being. Hardly wise counsel for the typical new convert. We encourage people to talk about their experience, particularly with those who know more about the faith than a new Christian knows. Secondly, we need to be wary of using contemporary experiences to interpret Paul. 
As has been frequently noted, Martin Luther, 500 years ago, fell precisely into this trap. Luther's life before his discovery of justification by faith was marked by periods of great depression and intense anxiety because he feared that he had not done enough to atone for his sin. To learn of God's gracious justification was to receive free forgiveness and the release of an enormous burden of guilt. And he interpreted Paul's experience in like manner. The only problem is that Paul never indicates that he was laden with guilt or frustrated by his unsuccessful efforts to win God's approval prior to his trip to Damascus. He felt fine with God, thank you very much. On the contrary, Paul testifies that he had made remarkable advances in his religious development. He was ahead of his class in every way. Third, we need to be wary of psychological psychologizing Paul's experience, that is, of interpreting the incident itself or its dramatic sequel in terms of modern psychology or psychiatry. The problem here is that the sources do not lend themselves to any such interpretation. With primary attention to verses 12 through 16 and occasional glances at other sources, what can we say about the experience Paul had? One, it represents a critical moment in the history of God's working in Paul's life. Paul says, but when he who had set me apart before I was born. What does the word set apart mean? Holy. Holy. Sanctus in Latin. Uh, He had set me apart. He had made me holy before I was born. And it called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among you Gentiles. The experience was, in fact, not the first time that God, the father of Jesus Christ, had had something to do with Paul. Before his birth, Paul believed he had been chosen for a task. Those hours of study under Gamaliel, the enthusiasm he showed in keeping the details of the Torah, the commitment which led him even to root out these blasphemous Christians, had not happened outside the eye of a gracious God. But Paul, I mean God, sorry, then God had decided it was the right moment and revealed his son to me. It was not his decision to become an apostle. It was God's decision. But what does it really mean to live as one so called and so grasped by God? And that's a word Paul will use later. I kept grasping for that which had grasped me in the letter to the Philippians. We'll come to that. Two things at least are worth noting. First, it means that life has direction and purpose. And second, the reality of being called and grasped provides enormous support for getting about one's task. Choices have to be made, many clouded by uncertainty and confusion. But self-doubts become paralyzing, particularly in the face of possible failure. One is called, called in the first place, not to be a salesperson or a surgeon or a soldier, but to be a Christian. And that means, as it did for Paul, to be a Christian witness. The decision as to what one is ultimately about in life, that is, being a Christian, It is not one's own to be fretted over. It's God's decision. In a single subordinate clause, Paul can include God's electing him, setting him apart, calling him, revealing his son to him, and sending him on to the Gentiles. It is more accurate to describe what happened on the Damascus Road with a broader term like call than conversion. Do you hear that? Martin Luther, 500 years ago, tried to convince folks that Paul had been converted. And just this week, uh, I was reading along and a woman uh, was writing a devotional material in, in a book of daily devotionals I was reading. And she's talking about how people are changed. She said, just as Saul was changed to Paul. Now, if anybody told you that years ago, that is not accurate. Saul and Paul mean the same thing. They're just two different languages. He wasn't called Saul before and Paul after. 
we're just talking about two different languages here. So what I'm trying to say is if you understand Judaism and you understand Judaism at its very best, Paul didn't feel lost. He doesn't use words like, I was lost and now I'm found. He says, God loved me before I was born. While I was still in my mother's womb, God had important things for me to do. He would believe, I think with all his heart, that God sent him to Gamaliel. That God had him circumcised. That God taught him to eat kosher. That God had brought him every step of the way until he came to that part about persecuting the church. There he was misled, I think Paul would say. He was misled. That was a mistake. He had seen God acting in his life and others' lives, but he did not see that God was acting in such a dramatic way, in such a unique way, in Jesus of Nazareth. He never knew him. Since Paul did not know Jesus of Nazareth, then what he knew about him did come from others, and he was convinced that if one believes in the monotheist, one God, one cannot believe that Jesus was also God. And that's still a really big hurdle for Jews, who many of whom have believed for centuries that we have three gods, we Christians. Now, that's not what the two rabbis in Tulsa believe, and that's not what they're teaching their people to believe. They're, they're acknowledging that, that that, okay, you can believe in one God who's revealed himself in different ways. And they acknowledge that, that that's possible for us. And it doesn't mean we are polytheists. We don't have multiple gods. We can have one, and this God has revealed himself to us in different ways. But Paul believed he was not lost. There had simply come a time in his life when he had heard some information that did not prove to be true. That is, that Jesus of Nazareth was some kind of malcontent who was going to disrupt and tear apart the very fiber of Judaism. So, the risen Christ met him on the road to Damascus and said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? We're fighting the same fight here. The message is, given first to Israel, now to the Gentile world as well. There's only one God. You shall love this God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Both of those things right there in Torah. But those great truths have been made flesh somehow in Jesus of Nazareth, Mary's child. Okay, maybe I'm over-dramatizing for you, but I'm asking you to be careful in the way we relate to Jews today. Paul would not have considered himself lost and now found. That was a slave trader's words. Once was lost and now I'm found. That's not the language Paul would have used. Paul believed he was found. He was a child of God. He'd gotten bad information. He'd accepted that as being true. Now the risen Christ had shown him, you got bad information. Jesus of Nazareth is not about splitting Judaism. He is about extending the mission to Gentiles. He's about infusing the mission with new Gentile energy and enthusiasm to help convince as many as we can there's only one God. This is what our God feels about us. And this is what our God expects of us and makes possible for us to do and accomplish in the world. Okay, are we clear about that? And the name didn't change at the moment of his conversion. We moved from one language to another. Paulus, Paulus is a good Greek name, but it's the same person, just in two different languages. Uh, so as Cephas and Peter. Uh, Peter's name was given to him at Caesarea, but here, years later, Paul's still calling him by the Aramaic name, Cephas. Uh, Twenty-five years later, he's still calling him Cephas. Okay, let's go on. There is something to be learned about the nature of the faith from the way Paul unites conversion and commission into a single event. The Christian is a recipient of grace and thus experiences reconciliation, forgiveness, joy, peace, and hope. We experience this through Jesus Christ. 
many hymns sung in our churches enumerate the benefits for us. The benefits have certainly uh, been popular themes for sermons. The trouble with this classic answer is that it's fraught with the temptation to assume that the enjoyment of God's gifts constitutes the only relevant and important reality to which God calls people. That is, my salvation, my peace of mind, my assurance of God's blessing, the fulfillment of my potential as a person doing my thing become exclusive concerns. A great theologian of last century, Karl Barth, argued that rather than a preoccupation with the good gifts God bestows on the individual Christian, the primary center around which life is oriented is the spoken word and the service of love rendered to the world. Certainly Paul's experience is a confirmation. None of the accounts mention his newly found joy, peace, or security immediately resulting from Christ's revelation to him. Instead, the accounts point to the mission to which he was being directed. The converted and commissioned Paul bears features of both continuity and discontinuity with the Saul of Pharisaic zeal. The God who has revealed himself in the face of Jesus Christ was the God of Israel, who had spoken to Abraham in anticipation of what would transpire through the Jews, had called Paul even before he was born. So the Torah and the prophets, which we Christians call the Old Testament, remained for Paul the only holy scripture, though read by him and others now in a new light. Israel retains specific prerogatives as the chosen people of God. Paul continues to regard himself as a Jewish Christian, though Paul aggressively counters those who insist that Gentiles must become Jews in order to be complete Christians. He himself never ceases to be a Jew. One reason why Paul has reacted as vigorously as he did in opposition to the first Christians was their incomprehensible message about a crucified Messiah. Now hear that carefully. Because in all the years I've been involved in Jewish-Christian dialogue, I've heard Jewish speakers any number of times struggling with this business of a crucified Messiah. They don't find it anywhere in their scriptures. We see it in the suffering servant of Isaiah. They don't see it there. They see that as Israel's suffering, not a person, not a specific person. And they, their teaching, they believe, was always a Messiah who would come and set things right, ensure justice and righteousness and so on. You and I believe Christ Jesus did that in one heart after another after another that are joined together now as the church. Uh, but that crucified Messiah was the really tough part. And so not unusual that that would be the tough part for Paul as well. How could they preach that a person admittedly cursed by the Torah, as seen by the manner of his death, uh, this crucifixion, had been raised by God from the dead? Such a message to a Jew is offensive until one is grasped by that Christ and discovers that he has been established Son of God with power. It has to do with how God sets persons and things right in the world, not through a vigilant keeping of the Torah, but in Christ who can be related to only on the grounds of faith. It's a gift one accepts or does not. To be grasped by the risen Christ is to discover a whole new world where standards of success, once dearly held, no longer really matter where criteria for decisions are radically altered, where people are viewed in a different light. Closely related to Paul's changed view of Christ is his view of the people of God. It was outrageous to consider that the Messiah had been revealed to people who were at best religiously marginal and many of whom who were heathen, pagan. God is the one, Paul wrote to the Romans, who justifies the ungodly, and his people are none other than the ungodly whom he justifies. The people of God are redefined to include people of faith rather than those with a specific religious and ethnic heritage. The law as a fence to separate Gentile from Jew 
must be done away. Neither race nor color nor gender nor economic status nor education nor politics plays any part in determining who shares in the community of God. Okay. Is that clear? Is it any of that clear to you? Um, I think Dr. Kuzar maybe protests a little too much, but what he's saying is that if we are going to be in serious conversation with Jews of our own day, and I can tell you that Paul is one of their least favorite characters because they think Paul created lots of problems for them. Um, You won't get that as dramatically from the two rabbis here in the city as you will from Jewish lay people. But I'm talking about in the 25-year Jewish Christian Jewish Christian dialogue group I've been in. Um, they, they, the lay people, their interpretation and their understanding of Paul is that he was a troublemaker for them. He was a troublemaker for them, and I think many of them would lean. The lay people would lean more to, if you wanted to be associated with us and kin to us, you should have submitted to circumcision and you ought to eat kosher. And so it still is ongoing with some um, that still have trouble identifying. So when we use words like conversion of Paul, Dr. Kuzar and other scholars, he's certainly not alone in this now, are trying to say, you're using a word Paul would never have used it himself. Paul didn't feel lost. He felt found. He felt he was a child of God loved of God and doing God's will. He really believed he was doing God's will when he stood there and held the robes of others while they stoned Stephen to death. He came to believe he had misunderstood and been misinformed. That there could be a crucified Messiah. And in fact, there had been one. The only one had been in fact crucified and now raised. That the one could follow this risen Christ. Okay? Let's read a little more. Chapter 2. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up in response to a revelation. Now notice how quickly he uses words like revelation. You and I, uh, maybe I should just say I, I have trouble sometimes with, with this business of revelation because you and I get strange folks on television often saying, God told me, God did, God did. And, and they so quickly say, and I'm not hearing God all these many times they say they're hearing God. You know, never have heard him with my ears. And even when I'm praying as hard as I know how for guidance and direction in certain areas, I don't always get such clear answers as they profess to get. And yet the very first rabbi who preached here in our Barton Clinton Gordy series, Rabbi Herman Shalman from Chicago, began his first sermon. His first presentation was the God of Sinai, the God who chooses to reveal himself. And Rabbi Shalman was saying, not that he had been hearing God every day during his lifetime, but he believed God did speak to Moses in a burning bush, did give him a new name, did send him back to Egypt, did visit plagues upon Pharaoh and his people until they released the Jews, did somehow get them across the waters of the Sea of Reeds, did bring them back to the Holy Mountain, did deliver Ten Commandments by which they were to structure their community. The God of Revelation. You and I believe in the God of Revelation too. We know God best in the ways God has chosen to reveal himself. And we believe the supreme, the best, the clearest revelation of God ever was Jesus of Nazareth, whom we call Christ and Lord. All right. I went up in response to a revelation. God sent me up there, up the hill to Jerusalem. Then I laid before them, though only in a private meeting with the acknowledged leaders. He didn't get up and preach to a thousand people. I laid before them the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not compelled to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. But because a false believer secretly brought in who slipped in to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus so that they might enslave us, by enslavement he means to to Torah again, have to be circumcised, have to eat kosher, We did not submit to them even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might always remain with you. 
And from those who were supposed to be acknowledged leaders, what they actually were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those leaders contributed nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel for the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter, making him an apostle to the circumcised, also worked through me in sending me to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who were acknowledged pillars, recognized the grace that had been given to me, they gave to Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They asked only one thing, that we remember the poor, which was actually what I was eager to do. Okay. The particular incident recorded here has attracted a great deal of interest through the years from historians seeking to trace the development of the early church. Where does this visit to Jerusalem fit into the sequence of Paul's visits mentioned in the book of Acts when Luke wrote? Of course, Luke wrote long after Paul was writing his letters. Did a struggle for power between Jerusalem and Antioch lie behind this meeting? Now remember that Antioch up here, uh, going just straight on north, modern day Lebanon and so on, and you, be, you come to Syria over here and Iraq here and so on, and you have Turkey. Uh, Antioch was, was a key outpost of early Christianity, and in fact, Luke says it was at Antioch that the followers of Jesus were first called Christians. So what Dr. Kuzar is asking is, there was there some kind of power struggle here between the church in Jerusalem and the church up at Antioch? He's saying that perhaps that could be so. Paul records for the Galatians his relations with the Jerusalem church. His purpose is to assure his readers that his reception of the gospel cannot be traced to another human source or influence, but only to the activity of the risen Christ. He explains that in his meeting with the pillar apostles, they added nothing to me. In fact, James, Peter, and John gave him their blessings, he said. Now, verses 1 and 2 give the reasons for Paul's trip. He was not called on the carpet by the Jerusalem leaders, but rather went by revelation. Paul was submitting himself to the authority of Jerusalem in order to get confirmation of his mission and message. Paul goes to Jerusalem with a certain amount of apprehension about whether the unity of the church can be maintained. Will these pillars in Jerusalem accept the way he's preaching the gospel? No circumcision, no eating kosher for these Gentiles. He has no interest in starting a new and separate cult. He sees himself as always, forever, tied to Judaism. He just hopes the pillars will see it also. Verses 3 through 5 relates the circumstances surrounding the possible circumcision of Titus, Paul's Gentile companion. How can Paul have taken such a decisive position in resisting the circumcision of Titus, and yet according to Acts chapter 16, have arranged for the circumcision of another colleague, Timothy? Ah, in the case of Timothy, his mother was a Jew. His mother was a Jew, and one's ethnicity is determined by one's mother. In those days, they couldn't tell for sure who was the father, but they definitely knew who the mother was. Timothy had a Jewish mother. So Paul acts on the basis of the freedom he has in Christ to become as a Jew for the sake of communicating the gospel to Jews. With Titus, however, the situation is different. He's being pressured by the false brethren, and to yield to them would be to renounce that very liberty that Paul had exercised in connection with Timothy. The two opposite actions Paul takes emerge from his awareness that God has graciously freed humanity from the burden of religious restrictions, including circumcision. Verses 6 through 10 record the actual meeting with the pillar apostles, the agreement on a common mission with a necessary division of labor. Uh, they, in Jerusalem, to the circumcised, trying to convince them that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah, and Paul to the uncircumcised. Paul does not disparage James, Peter, and John when he writes, and from those who reputed to be something, what they were makes no difference to me, God shows no partiality, those, I say, who were of repute added nothing to me. He is simply telling the Galatians 
that decisions about apostles should not be made on external considerations. Paul indicates that the meeting ended on a high note of agreement, fellowship, and mutual support. A word needs to be said about the relation of verses 1 through 10 to the next section we'll be reading next week, where Paul takes the initiative in confronting Peter publicly over a further issue regarding the Gentiles. It looks as if the unity reached at Jerusalem was short-lived. Paul certainly thought Peter was in error by his actions up at Antioch. There seems to be no question at Antioch about the Gentiles' entrance into the church without circumcision. A further problem emerges, however, should Jewish Christians forsake the ceremonial and dietary laws of their tradition in order to eat with Gentile Christians? Obviously, Peter and Paul disagree. Should persons, once Jews, continue to do Torah in addition to believing Jesus was Messiah, uh, or can they be as free from that Torah tradition as the Gentiles are now believed to be? We'll answer that question next week. Chapter 2, verse 11. That's correct. I thought the state law was that way. Yeah, that's right. I think the state law is still determined by who the mother is. Who the mother is and what her ethnicity is so determined by. If you haven't been to church, don't rush off. 